Welcome everybody to this Ceasing Now event, the return of Alexei Navalny. My name is Ben Noble, lecturer in Russian politics at UCL Cease and an associate fellow at Chatham House. This event is being recorded as Claudia has just mentioned, and the recording will be published on the school's YouTube channel. So please leave your camera off for the duration of the event if you don't want to appear in the recording. As many of you will know, Alexei Navalny, a leading Russian opposition figure, was detained on his return to Russia on Sunday the 17th of January following treatment in Berlin for poisoning. An investigation by Bellingcat provided evidence that Navalny was poisoned by the Federal Security Service, the FSB, in Tomsk, Russia, in August 2020 with another agent of the Novichok Group. The day after Navalny returned to Russia in January this year, a judge ordered that he be detained on remand until the 15th of February, given the Federal Penitentiary Service's claim that he violated parole conditions while in Germany, following a suspended sentence handed down to him in 2014. A court hearing is scheduled for the 2nd of February that should make clear whether he'll be sent to prison with his suspended, sent his suspended sentence turned into a custodial sentence. He also faces the possibility of an additional 10 years in prison for a separate case that was initiated by law enforcement in Russia in December 2020. On the 19th of January, Navalny released a video linking Vladimir Putin to the construction of a 1.35 billion US dollar palace on the Black Sea coast. The video on YouTube has so far been watched by more than has been watched more than 95 million times. A reminder, please do uh, stay on mute if you're on the call. Thank you very much. Navalny called for mass street protests on Saturday the 23rd of January, which resulted in demonstrations across the country. Senior Russian politicians have framed the Saturday protests as an attempt by Western powers to destabilize Russia through Navalny, but information collected from participants at the protests on Saturday suggests that many protesters came out in response to factors beyond and sometimes in spite of Navalny personally. I'm delighted to say that we're joined by three excellent panelists, and I can see that Ekaterina Shulman has just joined the call. Uh, 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 and so these uh, panelists today will help us make sense of everything I've just mentioned mentioned and more. Clara Ferreira Marquez is a Hong Kong based uh, Bloomberg opinion columnist covering commodities, environmental, social and governance issues, including relating to Russia. One of Clara's latest columns titled Poison, Arrest and a Secret Palace Fire Up Russians discusses the changing nature of protest in Russia in relation to Navalny. Professor Mark Galliotti is an honorary professor at UCL Cease and a senior research fellow at the Royal United Services Institute. His latest book is A Short History of Russia from the Pagans to Putin and that's published by Penguin. Last but not least, we're joined by Dr. Katerina Shulman, uh, and uh, Dr. Shulman is an associate professor at the Moscow School of Social and Economic Sciences and an associate fellow at Chatham House. Katerina is the leading public intellectual in Russia, commenting frequently on a broad range of topics. She was present at the 23rd of January protest in Moscow as an observer for the Moscow Helsinki group. Mark will begin by discussing why the Solidiki are going after Navalny now. Yekaterina will then discuss the protests in the context of Russian public opinion, as well as the upcoming state Duma elections in September. And Clara will discuss the authorities' response to the protests, including on social media, and by uh, comparing the protests in Russia to protests that we've seen recently in Hong Kong. Each panelist will speak for up to 10 minutes before we turn it over to you, the audience, for questions. When we get to questions, uh, please write your question in the Zoom chat and I'll select questions then to pose to panellists. This event runs till four o'clock London time, so without further ado, let me hand over to Mark. Mark, take it away. Okay, thank you very much. So why the Siloviki turn against Navalny now? Well, look, the honest answer is, of course, we have no idea unless we actually happen to have epaulets or work in Old Square or whatever, we can nonetheless make some guesses. I mean, the interesting thing is, it's worth stressing that point though about the now, that up to this point, there has been an unspoken but very clear understanding that Navalny will face periodic repression and so will his people, but not, shall we say, an existential level of repression he is allowed to continue his business, whether it's just simply as a pressure vent, 
whether it's in order to sort of maintain this uh, veneer of democracy on this hybrid regime. And at the same time, there is also an unspoken understanding that Navalny can, in his splendidly entertaining and forensically detailed video exposés of corruption, can go after anyone in the system except for Putin and his family. Those were the rules of engagement, which clearly were very decisively and dramatically broken in August. So why might that be? Well, I, I, I'm, I'm going to give you my own reading of it, with, but with all those caveats about the extent to which I could be totally wrong. The reason why I think the, the Kremlin decided to change the rules of engagement was really a, a concatenation of, of several different processes. One of them was just simply a Kremlin that is actually generally getting more and more crankily authoritarian over time. Um, that its, its circle is shrinking, it's less and less willing and interested in listening to external voices and other, other perspectives. It's more and more convinced that it is beleaguered. And that's the sort of the second key point. There are those who absolutely believe what for others is just simply a handy propaganda shtick. That is that Navalny is some kind of agent of Western destabilization. Gibridnaya Voina, as we all know, it's a it's terrible Western art that creates Arab springs and color revolutions and, and such like. Um, I mean, I was very struck by how quickly and how hard they went in on this line after Saturday's protests, not even hiding behind the usual deniable veneer of toxic and shouty TV pundits, which I use in the loosest possible sense, um, but actually on an official level, alleging that the American embassy had been part of the organ, you know, been organizing the protests and that Navalny himself was exactly an, an agent of the West above all the United States. I mean, frankly, even one can just follow, take your courage in your hands, the Twitter feed of the Russian embassy in Moscow and you'll be getting this. So it's not just, just from, from deniable pundits, but even from official sources, they're very quickly saying that. Now, obviously, this is a convenient line to try and delegitimize him and try and delegitimize the movement. But I think it's more than just that. I think the trouble is what we've come to realize is there are people within the system, people who do get to whisper in Putin's ear, however horrifying image that might be, um, their own words of poison and paranoia. And I think they have become more influential, more able to actually paint a picture for the boss that does see everything that's going on, whether we're talking about, you know, once upon a time it was Ukraine, now it's Belarus and elsewhere as evidence of a, a deep, sinister Western plot. So there was a sense that Navalny had perhaps crossed that very important boundary between the enemy and the traitor. I mean, it's this classic thing that, you know, we. we or at least meant to believe that Putin ha is of the opinion that enemies you fight with, someday you hope to reach some kind of a peace deal with them. Traitors though, well, you can do nothing with traitors except wipe them out. So there might be that sense that, that Navalny was in fact, after all, a traitor, not an enemy. And the final point I would throw out is actually that Navalny had become more inconvenient, more problematic, more dangerous, particularly with his smart voting campaign, this model of uh, tactically trying to encourage people to vote for whoever is most likely to be able to unseat a United Russia candidate in obviously particularly this, this September's Duma elections. Now, at the very time when United Russia is not exactly popular, its strength has always been its capacity to rely on the fragmentation of the opposition. If it is denied that strength, it's not that the government is going to lose the elections. The point about Russian elections is not what the result will be. The result will be whatever the Kremlin determines the result will be. The issue is how much effort does the Kremlin have to put in to getting the result it wants? And again, although I don't want to draw the parallel too closely, if we look at Belarus, there everything was, was, was pre precipitated precisely by an, a particularly obvious fabrication of the results. So with, with the Kremlin already having decided that it wants a uh, to try and maintain its supermajority. And with Navalny looking as if he could conceivably be a serious threat, that might have pushed them over the margin. And the last point on that, now I've only had this from one source, so I, I can't regard it as, as definitive, but we do know that the, um, the FSO, the Federal Protection Service, runs a lot of polling. And we also know, particularly because we have a very interesting uh, 
analysis by Medusa, um, that it tends to be downbeat in its assessment. It will tend to portray, if anything, an overly pessimistic view, perhaps in keeping with that of how security agencies tend to think of the worst case scenario. My understanding is that about between four and six weeks before the poisoning, the FSO actually used its polling to try and run um, a projection of how the state Duma elections could look. Now, I don't know the detail, but I understand they were definitely not good viewing for the Kremlin. So we don't know what point does a whole variety of, of different streams of opinion coincide. The people saying, look, Navalny, we, you know, he's actually a traitor. He's actually a Western agent. The people saying, look, smart voting could really be a problem and force us into a much more um, extreme falsification of, of the Duma elections. And people who just generally feel that we're just fed up. Why, why are we allowing this person to continue with his smart ass pot shots at us and so forth? That comes together may well have been enough to sort of to tilt the balance. And in the process, and this is the last point I want to make, the process, it very much raised the question of, is this a whole new paradigm for how the Kremlin looks at handling Russia? You know, are we now moving into a, a proper authoritarianism rather than the kind of soft postmodern authoritarianism of before that was all about controlling the narrative and making people apathetic rather than making people afraid? Well, I don't think that we can definitely say that that's happened. I think that that is precisely one of the debates that is currently going on behind the high walls of the Kremlin and in the other places where real debates and real decisions take place. People are now looking at the cost benefit analysis. Has this, is this going to work out? Is this not? Is this actually going to be more risky or is this the way forward? It could go that way, but we shouldn't assume it absolutely will. So there's a little bit of hope to end with. Thank you very much for that optimistic note, Mark. And let me hand straight on to you, Katerina. We can't hear you. You need to unmute. OK. Can you hear me now? OK, very well. Uh, thank you. And I thank the previous speaker for doing at least half of my work for me, because my aim was to uh, put the events happening around uh, Navalny in a broad uh, political context, connecting them with both the state of public opinion in Russia currently and the tendencies changing this state and this opinion and uh, the uh, political timeline of uh, 2021, in which the single most important political event uh, are the parliamentary elections. So I would first continue where Mark left off uh, and say a few words about these elections and about the machine of falsifications that uh, he mentioned and the limitations of its effectivity. And then I would describe how the uh, public mood uh, has changed since uh, at least 2018 and maybe a little bit earlier and where uh, Navalny and his, uh, how it is called, good machine of propaganda, good mission of truth, uh, where does it stand and how does it influence uh, what is happening. So the parliamentary elections are uh, bound to happen in uh, September. Uh, as Mark has mentioned, uh, United Russia has not been gaining in popularity uh, during these recent years, uh, but the previous parliamentary elections happened in 2016, and these were the last moments of the so-called Crimean consensus. It was still in place, but it was starting to erode. Uh, the voters' turnout uh, during the elections of 2016 were significantly lower than those of the previous uh, elections in 2011, which were followed by massive uh, protests. Uh, in a number of ways, we could uh, usefully compare the current political situation with the one in 2011-2012, when the previous comparable in numbers protest wave happened. Uh, again, all comparisons of this kind, all, all parallels have their limits, but in, in some way, I would say in a number of ways, we are somehow back in 2011. So what happened then? Uh, there were parliamentary elections with high voters turnout and with uh, high protest voting. Smart voting was not then in place and smart voting, the system invented and operated by Navalny is in fact the instrumentalization of this natural state of mind on the part of the voter who doesn't want to support an incumbent or a ruling party, but doesn't know what to do. And and so gathers a random 
candidate from the ballot just to show that he's against the candidate that is being thrust on him or her as the feeling of, of this voter is. Smart voting instrumentalizes uh, this, again, channels rather, uh, this uh, protest mood into a political instrument which is able to unseat well as experience has shown almost everybody so what happened then in 2011 uh we had this high turnout high protest voting this protest voting was directed or rather those who benefited from it were the so-called system parties systematic parliamentary opposition they allowed opposition they have gained more voices than ever before united russia actually lost its majority and during the first days i would say of the post-election period followed by mass protests mostly in russia but uh, mostly in moscow but also across russia though to a less extent with a less extended geography than the uh, protest demonstration of last Saturday, uh, quite a lot of this systemic quasi-oppositional newly elected deputies choose to publicly side with the protesters. Then the clampdown happened uh, and all the, the rest of the uh, history of Russia, which you are very much familiar with. So this was a kind of unsuccessful first run of the same sequence of events which may be repeated in 2021 exactly uh, almost exactly 10 years uh, ago another parallel which i think is also useful is a more chronologically close one uh, with the moscow city duma elections of the uh, summer and autumn of 2019 so what happened? Elections happened which previously were not very much interesting for the, for the voters. Uh, Moscow City Duma was neither well known nor very popular, and it has always been very much of a family affair between the Moscow City government and, and the Moscow City government. Voters were not interested in this. But what is called politicization happened. Uh, adverse economic conditions and general feeling of weariness, uh, the unspecified desire for some change, and Alexei Navalny came together to energize uh, the voters and turnout became slightly higher, but it's not just about the turnout, it's about what kind of people go to the polling stations. They tried to have the oppositional candidates registered failed totally no one of navalny's supporters were able to register as candidates this resulted in protests however no registration were achieved people came to the polling stations anyway and voted as directed by the smart voting what happened next the moscow government retained its majority in the moscow city duma but uh different type of deputies were elected they were officially representatives of the same systemic uh quasi-oppositional parties like uh справедливая россия fair russia or communist party uh but in case of moscow yablaka managed to uh get into the uh city duma for the first time in i think eight uh years so the majority was retained but the face of this parliament changed it became a much more visible much more public much more uh loud i would say place for political discussion to quote the immortal phrase of Boris Grozov. the same type of uh sequence may again happen in uh the summer and early autumn of 2021 as mark has mentioned it is not enough to publish the figure of election results you need to sell it to the audience you need to make society believe in it how this happens we can see from the example of the constitutional voting of the summer of 2020 what the general idea after these results were published was it was well maybe it's not 80 percent of those who supported the amendments but it was definitely more than half so the society in general the people as such internally agreed to the results they were presented with this is legitimiz legitimization this is what ensures a quiet post-election period and a kind of general public agreement to accept 
what has happened on elections. How it looks when this doesn't happen, we can see from the example of the presidential elections in the neighboring Belarus. You get out to people and say, I got 80%, and they say, no, you got 3%. And then the mayhem starts. So the difficult task of the Russian internal political management is to move between the Sila and Karibda, between the uh, loss of majority, and let me repeat, the stable loyalistic majority in the next parliament is absolutely essential to the safe conduct of any transfer scenario in whichever form it happens, even if it happens from one person to himself. This is also transfer. This does not safeguard the system from having to undergo the generational change and the consequent transfer of social capital, real capital, assets, influence, political positions from one generation to another. So you cannot escape this dangerous tunnel of political transit. Autocracies, even hybrid autocracies, are not good at it. They always hanker after stability, which they cannot achieve. If we look at post-Soviet space, we see very few cases of successful power transfer. Only one, which I would call the ideal scenario, the power transfer from father to son. And this happened in a country which is both uh, relatively small, ethnically uh, monogamous, uh, and rich. And this is Azerbaijan. All the other examples, again, I wouldn't go now into the political history of post-Soviet space. Uh, you are all, uh, I think, uh, experts uh, enough for this. You, you, you know it for yourself. So what is the what is in the minds of these people, of this Russian society, which will either accept or reject uh, the political picture presented to it? I have mentioned 2018 as a crucial year in the dynamics of, for example, trust towards the president as a person, uh, as a politician, and to the presidential power as political institution. Paradoxically, or maybe not so paradoxically, immediately after the presidential election, of 2018, which were so successful, I would say triumphant for the powers that be, this decline started. Uh, the first phase, I would say, of this decline, uh, we saw in the summer of 2018 following the uh, pension age reform, which was extremely negatively received uh, by, by the public. Okay, so uh, I, I, just in two words, since that time, the trajectory of trust went down. We have seen more stable periods, less stable periods, but we have seen no U-turn and no stoppage of this tendency. Even more, I would say remarkably, uh, the trust towards public institutions as measured in 2019 and 2020 show that 2019 was the year of decline for everyone, every institution from church to business, including the president and all the powers below him. 2020, in contrast, was the year of raising uh, growing trust, again, towards every public and political institution, church, FSB, police, regional authorities, local authorities, Russian banks, are not so evident targets of, of public trust, except one single exception, which continued its downward trend, and that was the president. This is so Again, I would say strange because in every other country struck by the pandemic, there was some rallying around the flag effect. We can say now that it happened even in Russia, but in this strange form of rallying around every flag except the presidential standard. So to, uh, to conclude, uh, Alexei Navalny uh, riveting as his personal history is to us politically is, is important in two points. First, as a figure able to, I would say, command uh, oh, well, influence uh, the masses and achieve, uh, organize public demonstrations on the scale that we have seen uh, on the January 23rd, and we have not seen uh, this, these things for, for quite a long time. And second, as an operator and the moving force behind the smart voting, which Mark has also uh, described as able to influence the outcome of elections in which neither Navalny nor his supporters participate directly. Thanks for that, Ekaterina. Brilliant. 
uh, crammed lots in. Uh, but I just want to clarify a point. You mentioned in 2011 that United Russia lost its majority. It still had 238 seats in the state Duma, so it still had a bare majority, but it only had 49% of the vote. Is that what you meant? Yes. Yeah. Brilliant. That's what okay, I mean. thanks. Just thought I'd clarify oh, that, sorry, sorry especially for... Sorry? Oh, don't worry. Oh. No, 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 don't apologise. I just thought that I'd clarify that before moving on. So let me hand over to Clara. Thank you very much. So by contrast to, to the others, I'll be thinking about the protests in a slightly um, more international, but obviously I'm in Hong Kong it's here for 2019 when we saw a full year of, um, you know, accumulating fairly dramatic protests. So I think we won't push the analogy too far, but it, it does help us to think about some of the components and certainly about how we see police response and how we see the government's response. So I'll just make a few points on that. And the first point that I would make is that cumulative protests are very hard for authoritarian governments to respond to. And by cumulative protests, I mean a protest that where the grievances have come in a cascade. I think, Mark, you had a really nice expression in, in one of your podcasts where you called it the coalition of the fed up. And I think that's actually an extremely eloquent way of putting it. This is a grievance that is Yes, Navalny has happened. Yes, the palace has happened. But it is also an economic grievance. Let's remember that macroeconomics are pretty good in Russia, but households really not so much as a result of fairly frugal uh, government support through the pandemic. And social justice is really a huge concern. And the reason that this is difficult for the government is because they see one trigger. They see Navalny or they see the palace, but the population sees many triggers. And it was very clear here in Hong Kong where we had the extradition bill. This was a bill that allowed people to be extradited to China um, for trial. And the government thought that that was the, the one trigger where really for people here very quickly, it became five demands of which one was universal suffrage and uh, the removal of the Hong Kong CEO. So essentially the president. Related to that, and the second point I would make is that it's also very difficult to deal with a very broad crowd of protesters, which is what we have here. I think we talked about before the event happened, there was a lot of expectation that youth would turn up, that it would be a very youthful protest. In fact, it, it possibly was in some places, but it definitely wasn't overwhelmingly so. It also wasn't the sort of overwhelmingly Moscow, um, Moscow intelligentsia that we've seen in past protests. It was really very varied and very spread across Russia. Related to that, it's not just the people that are varied, it's also the space. And that really matters, I think. The space has changed, the arena in which all of this is happening. And that's very difficult um, for, for governments like the Russian government because you are they're used to controlling the narrative through state media. And we all know that. We've seen Russian TV, Russian um, newspapers. It's a one-way communication. They are not prepared for the way that social media has advanced. Obviously, it's been around a while. It was around in 2011. It's been around through all these protests but it has really grown and cemented itself. And it allows, um, it allows three things really. One, it allows people to organize at the very basic level. They use Contactia, they use any of the many um, uh, Telegram, any of the many uh, social media apps to organize. It also um, creates a community, which is really, really important where you have constructed preferences, like in Russia, where people act because they are expected to act or they believe they are expected to act or support in a certain way. So it creates a community. It also broadcasts, and I think this is just so important with the way that Navalny has uh, worked social media, because yes, it broadcasts the news, but it also allows people to participate virtually. And the degree to which this had happened, I hadn't actually realized until I looked at some of the uh, commentary that Navalny's organization made, and obviously you can take the figures with a pinch of salt, but in Omsk, for example, you had 5,000 people on the street, but the live stream of the protest was followed by 500,000. So the potential here for people to feel included and to be included and eventually to come to participate is really huge. And I think Dorsch is another good example of that. If you look at the, the viewing figures for some of the live streaming and what we saw in Hong Kong is a very similar um, dynamic with social media. So we saw that the protests escalated. So at first um, they were small, then very, very large. And here at the peak, it was 2 million people, which is a quarter of the population. So really mass protests. And then it never really came off. So even when the violence began, the numbers did come down, but it sort of plateaued. And that's what social media allows you to do. It allows you to keep the conversation alive. So the problem for the state is they do not have a monopoly of this space the way they do in other places. There is no monopoly of the public square. More importantly, I think the state has no vocabulary to deal with this. They are unable to deal with this situation. They do not have what Navalny has. And if you've watched the, the palace video, I think it's a particularly good example of the way that he Fuses his personality, charisma, sarcasm, 
he's really, I mean, if we, we've all seen a lot of that story before, we've all heard the story before, but it's repackaged in a very, very powerful way uh, by Navalny. He is fluent, I would say, in the language of social media, the way he was in the court and the sort of this hearing in the police station. It's just so, you know, cracking joke, jokes. What was it? Um, he called him Died Wunker, the, the, the grandfather in the bunker, right? I think he referred to Putin at one point. He, he's just very good at, at, um, at, uh, at managing that and at creating the rapport. And it's very, very hard for Russia to control that because it hasn't, unlike China, which shut down social media very early on, uh, Russia has allowed it to flourish and is now coming in late in the day. And that's much, much harder to do. Um, and what I think we see as a result of that is, is this inability, the state's inability to comprehend what is going on. And I think we saw that very clearly in Putin's response. It's very unusual for us to see both Peskov and then Putin in his dialogue with students discussing um, the Navalny um, situation. Obviously, he doesn't mention him by name. He claims he's too busy to watch the film, but he does actually spend quite a lot of time. And one of the, the phrases that I can't remember if it's in that exact exchange with the students or whether it was at a separate exchange, he says at one point, this is not how politics is done. So I think that's really telling, a really telling way of saying that they, they do not have the way of engaging. They simply do not understand it. Um, and at the same time, obviously, he has legitimized it by virtue of bringing it into the public space. And he tries to joke. He makes this reference to 12 stools, the Skushna Dievichki, which, of course, is something he's used before. So it really falls very flat. It's not particularly funny. It doesn't sound particularly spontaneous. Um, it really doesn't work. And he refers to he tries to refer to the protest as a sort of wayward children, which was very much the vocabulary and the framing here in Hong Kong. The state is patriot, uh, as sort of paternal figure or maternal figure in this case, um, and the protest is this wayward children. That, that really doesn't um, play very well with people um, generally, as you might imagine. The consequence of all of this, obviously, of not having the vocabulary to dialogue, the very broad coalition, of the broad set of issues, is that it's <coughs> very difficult for the state to respond. In that, they are, in that they are inflexible. So the, the more complicated the set of problems that is presented to them, the more likely you are that they will respond in the one way that they know how to, which is essentially with a lack of compromise, shutting it down and with some level of, of violence. Um, it was very clear in Hong Kong that was the only way. They, there was no negotiation. Um, and what I did see that I thought was similar to what we saw here is the theater of violence. The fact that the police, the Amon show up with the helmets, with the suits before there is anything like that, that is not normal policing. So if you're turning up at a normal crowd, you turn up in much, you know, you're lower down and then you escalate as the crowd becomes more agitated. You don't turn up and, you know, you're trying to send a very strong message and the crowd reacts to that. And in Hong Kong, that very much was the case. The more armed the police became, the more active the crowd became. And I would just mention that it's very interesting to see um, the small incidents that we did see at the weekend of the crowd fighting back. There were the snowballs and there were a couple of fist fights. I mean, it's all fairly low key, but that did become a feature of the Hong Kong protests. And the Hong Kong protests, much like the Moscow protests, were protests that have been recurrent over time. So they happen, then there's a clamp down, then they happen or it, the issue is resolved. So they, they've sort of accumulated. And it very much felt like this sort of um, moment of uh, where, where it all breaks out. And what I would say is that the state here expected violence to turn the people against the protesters which I think is very much how um, the Moscow, um, Moscow has played it, how the state media has played it, you know, sort of the, uh, also the children, they arrested these children, this nine-year-old, look at this, isn't this disgraceful? In Hong Kong, that very much played against the government. So I would just say, we obviously will see how that plays out in Russia. It didn't, public opinion did not turn against the protesters despite the violence because they saw police violence as being a greater problem and the issue of children being caught up in the process again did not play in the state's favor. So obviously we'll we'll see how this all plays out, but hopefully a, a few things to think about there. Thank you very much, Clara, and thank you to Mark and you, Katerina, for your really stimulating comments. And I know that they're stimulating because we've already got a broad range of questions in the Zoom chat. So I suggest we take them a couple at a time. And I'm going to broadly leave it to the panel to decide who responds, although I might occasionally direct it to particular people. So let's... Uh um, uh, could I possibly use my privilege as a participant? What if I have a question for, for Clara? Uh, can I ask it right now? 
Uh, or should I'm I stand in say, line with others? So uh, you, I, I'll suggest that you don't go first, but I can sneak you in. I can put you to not the, quite the front of the queue, but near the front of the queue. Uh -huh, but please, rem please, please remind me if I forget <laughs> of our agreement. So let me begin with the first question and let me broadly summarize it. This is a question from Jan de Walden asking essentially by the authorities, their stance regarding Navalny, are they not running the risk of turning him into a martyr? So that's the first question. Could the Kremlin be making life more difficult for itself? And then the second question is from Hannah Hodgetts. And Hannah is asking uh, that Dosh, in their coverage of Navalny's return, made a reference to him being a Russian Nelson Mandela. But to what extent is that comparison legitimate? Please jump in, panelists. Well, OK, I'll say something. <laughs> Um, I mean, the, the, the question of martyr, it's possible, and I think this is why I suspect, and I absolutely hope I'm right, that Navalny is relatively safe at the moment. Um, having tried to kill him once in a, in a way that they thought was going to be an entirely um, domestic issue, which has then become an international one. I suspect that they're going to be sort of more cautious about, you know, having him fall down the stairs um, in his sizzle or whatever. Um, much better, I think, to firstly try and blacken his name by claiming he's nothing but a crook and an embezzler and so forth. Hence, this is why they don't use treason trials against him, but they use sort of financial misappropriations or libel and such like, you know, how could you libel a poor veteran? Um, so they'll, they'll try and blacken his name and just keep him out of circulation. Um, not least because if you keep him out of circulation, it might be that at some point you can gain some benefit from letting him go. If you think that that's sort of, again, the cost benefit analysis. You see the Nelson Mandela? Oh, I mean, the, the, these comparisons are always, I think, deeply problematic. Um, you know, any more than, is he Sakharov or is he Solzhenitsyn? He's neither because I mean, he, he's actually a very, very different type, type of politician to be perfectly honest. And that's it, he is a politician. He is not a moral icon. He is not just simply a, a dissident who just simply says, I cannot accept this and I can only put myself and my, my liberty and my body up against this. He is a politician who's trying to change things um, and, and has a, no doubt ambitions of his own. I think I don't think this is sort of, you know, he's lacking in the kind of hubris that any successful politician needs. So I would say it's, it's, it's not something that I really want to get into the who's he like. Arakato? Uh, well, I can only agree. Uh, I think it was Gleb Pavlovsky who was the first to say that uh, the uh, massive protest of, uh, of um, uh, last Saturday saved his life. Not, not life of Gleb Pavlovsky, life of Alexei Navalny, so it's not too dangerous uh, to kill him off. Actually, uh, this would be all very well if we didn't have the example of the previous attempt to get rid of him, uh, which runs counter, in fact, to my idea, or at least what, to what was my idea of how the system works, because the system doesn't like to be forced to make final decisions. It likes very much to have all the options on its hands. So I would subscribe to uh, Mark's opinion that it is much better for, from their point of view to make short term decisions rather than to like uh, I either kill him or give him 10 years. So I should think we are into a series of procedural, uh, dubious, dubiously procedural uh, decisions that will neither of them be final. But with a caveat, uh, it looks like they did try to make a to, to achieve a final decision of Navalny problem, uh, but failed. Uh, we cannot affirm that uh, they were so disheartened by, by this failure that they, would, they will never try to do it again. I'd agree. I won't add anything to that. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Clara. Um, Ekaterina, please ask your question now. I can sneak you in. So, yeah, thank you. Uh, I wanted to uh, ask Clara a question about the Hong Kong protest. Uh, looking from the far away uh, Moscow, uh, the protest of Hong Kong look exactly like the example of this very massive and persistent uh, protest campaign, which achieved nothing, which ended in uh, the status quo 
remaining the status quo, which kind of likens them, at least in our imagination, to the protest in Belarus and strengthen the point of those who say, you see, whether uh, entirely peaceful or with some component of violence, protest as such, no matter how many people take part in them, no matter how long they last, they achieve nothing politically. Does it look like that from your side? I think the comparison, obviously, this, this is where the comparison falls apart. I mean, the reason that Hong Kong is a better comparison for Belarus is that in both cases, you have the big brother, right? You have Russia supporting Belarus and China here, which means that you can always send in the tanks. Um, here, I would say it's not the status quo ante. It is, in fact, a much worse situation that we have ended up with. We now have a national security law, um, a, a lot of arrests. Um, you know, a lot of things that were permitted, even things like singing the national anthem are no longer permitted. So the protest anthem are no longer permitted. Calling for Hong Kong independence is now considered treason. So we are in a worse situation. I don't think that it's the end though, for these, these, these protests can go on for, you know, can simmer in different ways. So I think in that sense, perhaps it's not the most useful for comparison. One thing that I would say just in the context of Navalny is that these were leaderless protests. Um, and that that is quite um, as a result of having had the leaders uh, jailed in the past so to, to, to spare that and to avoid creating a focal point, they were leaderless. So that sort of brings this quite interesting in the Russian context of what happens if something happens to Navalny, what happens to the protest? I would say that the Hong Kong example will show you that they can continue. They can have multiple focal points. It does not have to be one person. So I'm not really answering your question, I'm afraid, but I'll just say that it's actually we're worse than we were before it started. Thanks for that, Clara. And that allows me to segue quite nicely into a question that has been asked by Francis Farrell, which is essentially, if Navalny disappears and his team are all locked up, is there a Navalny 2.0 who could replace him, a similar figure who could carry out essentially the same roles and functions that he is currently performing? Hmm. Well, I would say the, uh, without offense, the question is fairly pointless. Uh, Navalny team is not some numbered list of persons whom you can all lock up. It's a system of regional headquarters which relies very much on volunteers uh, and supporters online, which you cannot all somehow, as, as Mark said, wipe out. Uh, and we all hope and suppose that Alexei Navalny will continue his political career in his own personal capacity without the need of any uh, Navalny 2.0. If something really happens to him, I will not be the person to speculate uh, what happens next. Thank you. Clara, anything to add? It seems that Mark, we've lost Mark, the connection, but uh, we still have two panelists and that is more than enough. So let me move on. Uh, by the way, Francis, I thought your question was very good. So um, you know, don't let your Katerina uh, make you feel bad about asking it. Uh, let's move on now to uh, into the international dimension. Ada Wordsworth has asked a question about what the detention of Navalny means for Russia-EU uh, relations um, and how much power the EU, and maybe I would also add, or appetite, political appetite the EU has for pushing um, the political leadership in Russia on this point. Well, I can make a start and then I hope Katrina will no doubt come in and, and um, help me out. Um, obviously, it isn't particularly helpful. Merkel in particular, in particular has come out personally for Navalny and for his extradition. I would also be very curious to see what the EU does do, and especially in the context of a more active US uh, presidency. They, they came out pretty actively as soon as he was jailed with quite strong comments, the likes of which we have not seen. Um, but I always wonder about the effects of, of some of what the EU does and some of the sanctions that they put in place. They really strengthen the narrative of us against them within Russia. Um, the, you know, they're all against us. I question how uh, useful that is, even though obviously I understand the political necessity for it. So yes, obviously this isn't particularly great for, for EU-Russia relations, but I don't know how much worse they could become, Katrina. 
Uh, well, uh, I have no clue when it comes to foreign policy, so I can only add uh, that's that's the moment we, we should be sorry that we have lost Mark, who could intelligently answer this question. But uh, I can only uh, add a few points that concern uh, Russian public opinion and how things appear from inside. Uh, I understand uh, that uh, the, the elites are waiting for some sanction activity from the new presidential administration in uh, United States. Uh, they, they have seen a lot of familiar names coming back now from the second term of Obama. Some have called it the third term uh, of, of Obama team. Uh, so now they're all back to uh, manage uh, Russian relations. And I see some expectations of sanctions in the year. Although as being the specialist in the field that I'm in, I don't know what that means and what are exactly the expectations are. But uh, about the narrative of us against them, Again, starting 2018, we have seen the general decline of this uh, besieged castle mentality, sadly not on the part of the authorities, but on the part of the respondents. And here, by the way, uh, the focal point was the World Football Championship, which happened in the summer of 2018. Since then, we have seen uh, the rise of, well, good feeling towards almost every country in the world, even Ukraine. Uh, that's for an enemy, uh, even United States, that that paragon of all things evil. Now, uh, after the presidential elections in the United States, hostility towards uh, uh, the states have slightly risen, but not significantly. So we see nothing uh, resembling a pre-war mobilization uh, of public opinion. This will not deter the decision makers from making the decisions, but I think it is a thing to be at least to be kept in mind. Thank you both. Now let me ask a question that is uh, very general. I'm going to ask two questions, in fact, that relate to each other. The first is from Federica uh, Prandin, Prandin, depending how we pronounce the surname, apologize for, uh, apologize, uh, for garbling it. But broadly speaking, are the process that we're seeing right now, could they lead, are they the beginning of the end for the Putin regime? That's one question. I imagine you will both have clear ideas in response to it. And the second question from Balo Gunnarsson, is, uh, is there anybody in the current political elite or outside it who, if the protests get out of hand, could and would might want to push Putin out of the way? Could we see a, a coup scenario? So two questions. Mm, again, how good it would be if Mark was uh, with us at the moment, coups are his cup of tea, uh, exactly. Um, so the, fir the first question was about is this the beginning of the end for the ah, the end. Oh, yes, of course. Uh, and, and yes, we, we have the schedule all, all set out uh, quite clear. Uh, I mentioned the transfer tunnel the difficult process of transformation, the main business of the 20s, and the chief political uh, plot of the first half of the 20s, starting from previous year and to uh, 2025, I would say. Uh, whether the system will survive in its entirety, to what extent will it be transformed are broad questions. We watch the process that we follow, uh, but we should not concentrate on personalities. Although we are a personalized uh, autocracy, we are not, the system as such is not so much dependent on a single person as is uh, generally supposed. Whether the events will move faster from now, I don't know. I'm afraid we're kind of caught in the drama of this daily news. Uh, not that we exaggerate the importance of what is happening, but again, let me repeat, mass protests as such very rarely achieve political changes. They basically serve to signal to the elites that they will have allies should they choose to have allies outside of this uh, tower, of this tower of power of this Kremlin walls. Uh, and this leads us nicely to the question of coup. Uh, they are generally statistically uh, much more widespread in autocracies of our type than the overthrows of the powers by means of the revolting masses. 
So it usually happens that there's some discontent and some elite groups make use of this discontent. Now, we have mentioned the massive success uh, of uh, these investigative videos. The last of these videos and the most phenomenally successful one, and I'm still staggered by these figures. The, I, don't, I, I didn't know there were so many eyes in Russia as there are views of this video, but uh, this is how we see it. But imagine how those from the inside see it. For them, it means that there is somebody, some traitor, close, very close, who leaks this information. They do not believe in open sources. They believe in nothing like investigative journalism. They do not know such things exist. For them, the world is just the playground of security services and of traitors who, again, who leak information. And this kind of thoughts, this kind of ruminations, are, again, extremely typical of the aging autocracies. They are always looking for some traitor inside. And this, to put it mildly, does not contribute to the stability of, uh, of the system. So uh, returning to, to the cool question in all its ugly nakedness, uh, the president, as a political, I would say, institution, served to ensure the stability of the system in various ways. First, he provided internal legitimacy. He was personally popular. No one else within the elite was to be compared with him. He provided external legitimacy. He was a, spoke, a spokesperson for Russia in the outside world in a way no one else could have been. And he served as a arbiter of elite disagreements as the preserver of the great equilibrium. Well, both, all three of those functions, he still manages to, well, continue doing, but each of them to a less and less degree. I have already described the trajectory of his popularity. Uh, again, no one is second to him around, we do not see a potential successor. Although, by the way, uh, prime minister is quite popular. The government has risen in, in popularity because the previous cabinet of ministers was extremely unpopular. Again, why? Because no one liked uh, Dmitry Medvedev. And why so suddenly people started to dislike Dmitry Medvedev? Uh, one of the very influential factor was the video made by Navalny. No one cared much for Dima before that. And then he suddenly emerged from this slightly comic and somehow likable figure, a kind of ridiculous but still progressive reformer wannabe into a corruptional like all the rest of them. Are we going to see the same thing happen to the president? Uh, again, minus the ridiculousness and the progress uh, and the likability possible. Uh, so the government is, is pretty popular as well as the, uh, the head of the government. Uh, the mayor of Moscow, again, more or less. But uh, with this recent events uh, around Navalny, he has made himself into a second public politician in Russia. So now there's Putin and anti-Putin and the game is played out between them. Is this situation uh, rather leading towards or provoking people who may think of some form of uh, elite uh, revolt or whether it's deterring them? Uh, well, there are certainly grounds for some groups within the elites deciding that they may better keep uh, their assets by, well, putting in bluntly, getting rid of the unpopular president in any form. Uh, this does not ne necessarily mean a coup in its dramatic, uh, old historic forms. For example, uh, remember what happened in 1999. We had an unpopular president and his surrounding and uh, the oligarchs who wanted to keep what they got. What they did, they convinced the president that he should better not run for the third time, although there were legal opportunities for that. Uh, but he should present the public with the successor who instantly, almost instantly, became popular. These are also some forms, some ways in which elites achieve uh, such power transits. I would just add one thing, which is that coups are not a very helpful way. It's how we think about it in a very dramatic and sort of cinematic way. And, you know, Navalny comes in and um, I was interviewed on the radio and they sort of wanted me to describe Navalny coming back, you know, sort of like Lenin coming back to the Finland station. And 
And in reality, it's very different. I tend to think of it more in terms of a system that comes under greater and greater strain and becomes more and more brittle. Um, and a better comparison for that is probably the Soviet Union. So the edifice is there, but it's increasingly hollow and at one point it collapses. But guessing when that point is, I think is just a fool's game. We, it's very, very hard for us to do. And I just remind everyone that there are a lot of autocrats hang, hanging by a thread. Um, our neighbor in Belarus, our friends in Venezuela, you know, the world is full of autocrats that we thought would be gone within a minute and that are still hanging in there. But I would say that there are a lot of strains coming Russia's way, not just the economy, but bigger issues like uh, the energy transition, the move away from oil. This is an entire political system constructed on oil. So all of this will just add to the strain and just think of it as an edifice that just becomes weaker and weaker and weaker. And eventually somebody will be positioned, the elites will be positioned. But I think to think of it as a coup is probably to limit the shape that it will take. It will probably take quite a different one. Obviously, we don't know. Thanks for that, uh, Clara. Let me then pitch a question directly to you, Clara. And this is a question that comes from uh, Diana Camille. And Clara, knowing that you are watching Putin's comments in Davos, this is the reason why I'm pitching this particular question to you. So Diana says that uh, during his speech to Davos, Putin spoke of inequality and political radicalism as factors that could be the cause of the next global conflict. Uh, but how do you treat those comments in light of Navalny's video, Putin's palace? Is he being ignorant? Is he being intentionally provocative? What's going on? Oh, I think um, we can take Putin's comments the way we can take Xi's comments from earlier in the week. I mean, Davos serves a very particular purpose. It's a very unthreatening environment. They are basically completely curated. You know, it's, it's, it's very limited in terms. It's also not for a domestic audience. So I think it's really what he's broadcasting here is a, I think a lot of the themes that he's, um, he's come up with before, um, the instability, multipolar world, what I would say, so just as a caveat that I haven't listened to the whole thing because I was listening to it just before we began this, I would say that I found it really interesting that he brought up the threat of social media and the monopolies of social media and social media as an alternative state. And I think that that is not a narrative we have heard from the Russian government before, certainly not at this level. And to bring it up in an international forum when he knows that this is one of the sort of hot button issues for the US administration, Certainly it is a big, big issue for Russia now with what's happened with these protests and the need to clamp down and to remove, um, and even before that, some of the legislation that we've seen coming in really to protect the government from, from social media. So I did think it was really interesting that he brought up big tech in a threatening way and in a proto, as a proto government. So I think that, so I'm not really answering the question here, but I would just say that I think that was one of the really, um, really salient points. We've had a number of questions, thanks for that, Clara, relating to social media. And one of those questions is from Lucy Burge saying, do you think the uh, Kremlin's response uh, and uh, I suppose state agency responses regarding TikTok, Kontaktia, YouTube, asking them to take down information, especially calls for people to join the process. Do you think that was partially emboldened by Twitter's blocking of Trump? That's Lucy's question. So that's the first question. And let me ask another uh, social media question. And that is from James Bolton Jones. And James wants to know a bit more about TikTok. Um, uh, uh, and he wants to know insofar as TikTok is a Chinese app, how does that complicate the situation regarding the Russian authorities response to TikTok? So to both of you, Clara, if you want to jump in. It's a bit of a bomb there. <laughs> I'll just I'll start and then uh, um, I think I'm out of the TikTok age range. But just on, on the blocking, I think it is tempting to connect it to Twitter, but I don't think that that was the narrative here. I think the Russian government tends to think of the media and social media by extension as something it can control. Um, and the, the asking for things to be removed is, is not uncommon if you are working as a journalist in Russia. So I do not think that that I think that's how they thought about it. And in the context also of legislation, you know, that they have been preparing that would also help restrict, um, you know, Russia is not the only country that, that has this, by the way, but um, other countries too have used fake news legislation, for example, to restrict um, what goes out. So I think I would relate it more to that, to a desire for control, obviously an extremely blunt um, instrument. So there's no attempt to be um, subtle here about what's going on. I think that is quite problematic. I'd really connected to that rather than, than to Twitter necessarily. In terms of it being a Chinese app, 
that's quite a good question. But you know, the, the really interesting thing for me is that we don't have it here. So we don't have TikTok. Well, this is obviously I'm in Hong Kong and not in mainland China, but TikTok is not a Chinese app. So protests here were organized on Telegram. <laughs> so it's, we're sort of organizing each other's protests. I, India is one country that has had a precedent of blocking um, by chance TikTok, so it could happen. Um, but I think here it's probably there will have to be a broader stance because it wasn't just TikTok. TikTok happened to be the memes that went viral or the little sort of videos that went viral. The girl uh, teaching people how to say, uh, you know, I've, I've left my passport at the hotel and all of that is quite good. I think that's very eye-catching. I don't know how indicative it is of the broader content. I would say that a lot of Russians are also on more traditional Russian social media. Um, so I don't think banning TikTok would uh, make a huge difference. And I don't know that it would, um, that the diplomatic aspect would come into it, though it, with India it has to some extent. Thanks, Clara. Uh, I can only add that the Russian authorities do not have a very good record of blocking anything. Uh, they have succeeded with um, a number of sites and even then uh, Russians, as you know, are traditionally technically savvy and so VPN is a household tool and the infamous story of uh, the Russian state's battle with Telegram is well known. So I would not predict much trouble for either TikTok or YouTube, although I, I'm watching the latest legislation that's been uh, uh, adopted by the state Duma in the end of last year, the one that is called uh, defend, defending the, the informational freedom or something uh and and this is this is about punishing youtube for not showing enough uh patriotic videos in the trends uh we'll see how this plays out but uh, before that we have had quite a lot of this type of legislation which serves rather as a pretext for bargaining with big international tech companies rather than for actually shutting them down it's uh more related to asking for some favors, maybe for some information sharing, uh, than uh, a, a flat attempt to ban them from Russia, which is technically difficult and politically also troubling because a lot of people are on TikTok uh, and they, they have politicized already, but trying to meddle with them will politicize them in all probability still further. Thank you very much, Ekaterina. On to two new questions. This first question is uh, a hybrid of lots of different questions that have been asked, and it was certainly a topic that I wanted to raise and to ask the panelists. And that is, how, to what extent, how should we, commenting on what's going on in Russia, and I suppose there the we uh, uh, is people um, in the UK and in the West, more broadly speaking, how should we make sense of Navalny's past statements that might be regarded as being nationalist, xenophobic, or racist? How should that feature in our commentary on it? But Yekaterina, how domestically is that issue being negotiated? Is it being discussed? One of the questions are specifically about liberal intelligentsia in Russia. So that's the first question relating Navalny's uh, past statements. And then the second question uh, that was asked by Imogen Wade relates to Yulia Navalnaya. To what extent we have a Svetlana Tikhanovskaya 2.0. Hmm. Uh, well, as Mark has uh, noticed before disappearing, Navalny is not a moral icon, nor is he a dissident, but he's a political actor. He's been searching for support base. And around 2013, I would say, it looked like the Russian nationalists are a growing uh, strata uh, of the political population. But then uh, 2014 happened and they all disappeared under the, the mass uh, of state patriotism and never emerged from there. Uh, there seems to be no very great demand for ethnic nationalism in Russia, as opposed to uh, maybe the so-called empire nationalism. But that was a wear to a thin thread uh, during the Crimean consensus years. Uh, so uh, he's been saying a lot of things. He is out in the public since I would say the early 2000s. So you can make a hefty collection of his quotes on any subject in an almost every political direction. The fact of his having been a kind of a nationalist in his younger years is uh, sometimes recollected by the elderly uh, type of Yablaka supporting uh, uh, liberal uh, 
dis disappointed liberal voter, but they are neither numerous nor very vocal. So I wouldn't think that is an important factor. Currently, it is not dis discussed at all because too many things happen uh, right now that are uh, much more worth uh, the public attention than something he said back in 2010. By the way, uh, now that we are uh, having this discussion, uh, Clara said that uh, Putin is having his speech in Davos uh, the next or. Oh, we're having Mark back, good. So we're not going to have an unf unfair share of uh, answering the questions because it was a manifestly unjust distribution. Uh, <laughs> there had to be three of us, not, not two of us. So um, Navalny team has published a new investigation. It's not in the video form, but in a text form and it relates to alleged form of poisoning by the same FSB team. Uh, two of the alleged victims are from uh, Northern Caucasus. Mm -hmm. And one is Nikita Isayev, uh, a kind of familiar, familiar person, a young, extremely loyal, loyalistic political figure who died suddenly on a train, I think, two years ago. So uh, Bellingcat uh, and the Insider, and uh, I think uh, they, they have the, the German uh, newspaper uh, as a partner, um, Spiegel. Uh, they affirmed that he also was poisoned for, for what godly reason? Okay, that, that's not the that's not the question you asked me um, to uh, to answer. So th that was about Navalny having been uh, a nationalist and having said uh, some things he wouldn't like to repeat now. And uh, the second question was about Yulia Navalny. I understand the Tikhanovskaya parallel, but these are quite different cases. Uh, Yulia Navalny has been uh, much more of a public figure and much more her husband's political partner rather than just a housewife and a mother of his children. Uh, I remember my impression when I have watched their uh, joint interview with Yuri Dut, the one immediately after his recovery when he was still back in Germany. And uh, it was the first time I've seen her speak at any length. And it seemed to me that it's not the case of a radical husband and a kind of softer, more um, more peaceful leaning wife at his side. I don't know who is a bigger radical among them. So uh, I would rather, for the sake of Russian political stability, maybe I would advise us to stay with the current oppositional leader rather than try to exchange him for any new you know, faces. Maybe it's not the case of the devil we know, but still, still maybe let things stay as they currently are. Thank you. And let me say, it's great to have you bark, uh, back Back Mark, not Bark Mac. Uh, it's great to have you back. Uh, the internet is now working. Um, uh, Clara, if you wanted to respond to uh, those two questions, feel free to do so now. I'll just quickly quickly make a comment on the nationalist background, but I think I personally quite like to hear what Mark has to say on this particular issue. I would just say that in terms of my own commentary, when I publish and you know what I do with reference to, I, I tend to think of Navalny as a man who has had many acts. I mean, he was a shareholder activist, then he was this. You know, he has tried many different things. I think it is important context when we think about his popularity because the nationalism has been used as part of the state smear campaign. But I think we really ought not to dwell on it too much because it certainly isn't where he is today. And it's also, as, as Katrina very um, accurately pointed out, it is not where the political wind is blowing. So I think it's important context, but it's really half a line. It's not, um, I don't think it's much more than that. But Mark, I don't know how much of the question you heard. But. So Mark, uh, hopefully you've, you're understanding what we're talking about, the extent to which we need to take uh, Navalny's past comments into account. But as well as getting your thoughts on that, let me also pitch another question. Uh, I asked a few foreign policy questions and Clara and Katerina thought that you would be best placed to answer those, and I agree. Uh, so let me say that the second question to you beyond the uh, Navalny's past statements that could be regarded as being nationalist, xenophobic or racist. Tom Bonner has asked a question, uh, given what's happening at the moment with domestic unrest in Russia, or at least the protests, uh, can we expect to see a more aggressive foreign policy, uh, partially with a view to distracting or uh, manufacturing a rallying round the flag effect? Okay, thanks very much. Well, I, I hope this works. It's a very... Um sort of a jury rig set up without any nice microphone or similar. Anyway, on, on Navalny, I mean, I'm, I must admit, I, I feel that, I wonder how many of us, if we had lived our lives as publicly as Navalny, 
would, 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 would measure up to the standard that seems to be being required of him, of, of, of every statement and so forth. You know, we're not electing a new pope. We are not choosing who's going to be beatified next. We're not even actually talking about who is going to be elected as a leader in a Western democracy. We are talking about an opposition figure who is fighting a particularly unpleasant, kleptocratic, and when it comes down to it, often actually quite, quite xenophobic and uh, racist regime. Has Navalny said things that I'm sure he re regrets and that he shouldn't have said? Yeah, absolutely. Do I really think that that's a particularly salient issue today, the, the man who is today? Not really. And I can't help but notice that there are many non-Russians, non-ethnic Russians, who absolutely support Navalny and don't see him in any way as being someone who oppresses them. Final point I make on that, I mean, one thing Navalny is very, very clear about is the importance of law, of legality. The, thing, the good thing about legality is it means it doesn't matter so much about the attitudes of the people at the top of the system, because the point is the law is there to protect everyone. So yes, let's be aware of it. It's, it's part of his backstory for certain and maybe current story. I can't help but feel that in some ways, politically, being a bit racist may not necessarily hurt Navalny. You know, he's racist enough not to look kind of bizarrely Western degenerate woke, perhaps, who knows? Um, but anyway, that, that, that's my take on that. In terms of a rally around the flag, look, I think what we have to realize is we, we have become slightly obsessed by the fact that Crimea led to the kind of the Crimean effect. There was but one Crimea, you know, this area that basically everyone, pretty much everyone, including after all Navalny, felt was rightfully Russian, everyone within Russia, obviously. Secondly, that could be taken incredibly easily without major loss of life. Now, there, there are no more, no, no one in Russia is sitting there thinking, oh, if only Belarus was, 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 was part of our territory. No one even cares, frankly, about Donbass. That, that is the sort of, you know, the, the, the honest truth. This is why, frankly, the Kremlin lies about the presence of its forces in the Donbass, about the level of its commitments in Syria and Libya and elsewhere. It is not deniability to us, but it's not actually as if we believe them. It, deniability to its own population. There is no real enthusiasm. Sure, if all of a sudden there seemed to be a genuine, um, sort of, I would say, assault on Russia from the West, there would be a degree of rallying around the flag, but it has to be real. And so actually, I mean, I think that obviously the, the Kremlin will huff and puff, especially when it's placed under sanctions or more sanctions, um, or when it has, uh, you know, gets being lectured at by DC, Brussels, whoever. But in terms of moving beyond that, no, I don't think so. I think actually it realizes that anything like that would probably be more of a grievance, more likely to inflame opposition rather than anything else. Thanks, Mark. Let me put together another hybrid question to all three panellists. This is drawing on a number of questions, so I'm not going to name people who ask them. Apologies if you um, uh, don't like that approach, but it's most efficient. We have about 50 minutes left, so I want to ask as many questions as possible. And the question boils down to this. Uh, to what extent is uh, the w statements of support from the West, both by the public but by politicians, to what extent does that actually make Navalny's situation worse insofar as he can then be more successfully portrayed by the Kremlin and by uh, Kremlin associated media as a stooge of the West, as a CIA operative? Um, so I, I'd be really keen to hear what panelists think about that. Mm, well, uh, I should think he is being portrayed as such and will be no matter what happens in Russia or outside of it. Uh, but there's another uh, side of this uh, of this issue. You know that uh, the most important thing for a political actor striving for power is to engage the sympathies of not, not of his supporters, but of those who don't care so much about policy of what has been called in the French Revolutionary Parliament, the swamp this middle ground people who actually decide in the end uh, whom to side with. And in order to appeal to the status quo supporters, it is important to, well, to uh, fulfill your claim to power by being somebody already. 
One of the most dangerous uh, things that can be said about a political actor is that he or she has no experiences, he is in fact a nobody. See how it is being used against Svetlana Tikhanovskaya. So being supported by important figures, figures of power in the West, uh, contribute to his status as a genuine political leader, as not just, why, why are they calling him a blogger? Because it's not even a job. Everyone is a blogger. So the question, who is he to even presume to attack our glorious president? Who is he to imagine that he can handle Russia? Censorship. <laughs> who, who, who turned off my sound? Uh, so in this, in this respect, if we look at, at this from, from this point of view, then the support of, uh, again, not, not of some foreign public, but of the heads of the foreign governments uh, may contribute to uh, his status, his political status in the eyes of, of the Russian audience. He has already been uh, portrayed as sinister and foreign, but important by the state TV that has been peddling this story since August. Uh, we know from polls that his recognizability has risen much more dramatically than his either his support or uh, anti-rating, either his rating or anti-rating. So they have worked uh, with all their might to, towards making his name familiar to those uh, parts of the audience that may have not heard of it before. Now they know that there is such a person, that he's again dangerous but important, or important and dangerous, that he has supporters, that there's some kind of clique around him, that he's head of some sinister organization, and so he matters. He is not to be dismissed and he is not to be ignored. This is the same kind of thing that uh, can be achieved even in the eyes of those who do not watch him with sympathy, but at least with interest by this uh, foreign support. Thanks, Katerina. Mark, Clara. Okay. Um, sorry, I, because I'm on my phone, I can't see, it, see, see the others, so my apologies if I end up sort of stepping on someone's toes at one point. But I mean, to, to, to give my take, I mean, I, I very much agree with what Katerina has said, that precisely the, the Kremlin has, by having to abandon its previous uh, Voldemort strategy of basically making him unnameable and you know, taboo in all respects, has precisely contributed to, to making him more formidable, if not necessarily more appealing. But that's, that's fine. I mean, the very fact that these protests were full of people who supported Navalny, but also full of people who didn't necessarily support Navalny, but just simply this was the catalytic moment for expressing their views about how they weren't, weren't happy with things. By having Navalny as a, a force, it actually reminds people of the existence of politics, of actually the existence of choices. On terms of what the West can do, I mean, it, it is a delicate balance because absolutely, I mean, the, the propagandists do not need facts to create their tissues of uh, conspiracy theory and such like. But on the other hand, they will happily take whatever facts they are given. I think that the, the concern is not so much that it contributes to this notion of Navalny as a Western agent. As I said, that, that, that they're gonna try and present. Um, it's more that if it looks too much as if the West feels that uh, from its high lofty moral pinnacle, it is trying to dictate what happens in Russia. That is the risk, not so much necessarily from a public point of view, that there are some people who will actually um, be, be, be turned off by that, but precisely from the point of view of, of the state. This is, this is a state that regards itself as being in an existential political struggle with the West, that feels the West precisely is trying to marginalize, exclude and constrain it. And it's, this is a, an essentially, again, an emotional response rather than, you know, we shouldn't think of this as com complex realpolitik. This is basically a bunch of aging homo sovietici um, who are railing against the end of empire and the end of that. And if the fate of Navalny somehow becomes tied up with Western influence, if almost it looks like they're being dared, that, oh, you can't touch Navalny because we say so. I don't think that they're actually going to pull, put it up against a wall or anything like that. But nonetheless, I, I think it will actually radicalize the Kremlin. I think that for me is the real risk that the Kremlin feels not just that the usual sanctimonious hypocrites in the West are lecturing us, but actually 
wow, this really is being used by the West as an attempt at uh, regime change or at least regime modification. And we must push against that. Thanks, Mark. Clara. I'll let you move on to another question to cover more ground. I think I wouldn't add too much. That's a fantastic answer. Okay, thanks. So we have just under nine minutes left and lots of questions have been asked about Belarus in multiple dimensions. So I'm just mentioning that uh, not uh, as a lead up to ask a question, it's to say that I've seen all the questions. I know that that's a really important topic, including whether the Kremlin has carried out some authoritarian learning and whether it will be using Belarus to learn about what it should do and the steps that it should and shouldn't take going forward. Um, uh, but also uh, we can regard the Belarus example, uh, not from top down, from bottom up, to what extent might Belarus be used as um, a, a point for those people who are going uh, to protest. So I acknowledge that question. I'm not going to give the panelists an opportunity to respond. What I am going to do is, uh, as we move to the very final part of the talk, to ask the panelists to speak about what might happen next. What are their expectations for the 31st of January? And broadly speaking, where will these process end up? Can they be sustained? Um, who's going to win if this really is a battle between um, uh, the Kremlin and also the coalition of the fed ups, if I'm, uh, maybe I'm misquoting Mark now, uh, but let me hand over to the panel and remind we have just around over seven minutes left. Ah, so what will happen next? That's, that's one of the simplest of uh, questions. I have tried to uh, point to the uh, key moments of our political timeline of the year. Uh, the next uh, protest demonstration is scheduled for uh, next Sunday, uh, January 21st. Tomorrow, we are going to have one of the numerous preliminary uh, court procedures uh, connected with uh, Navalny's being detained for 30 days. M most likely, he'll stay where he is. Then we have uh, his trial on February the 2nd, where, when again, the most likely at the moment scenario would be he's getting three years and a half uh, of real term uh, in exchange for his probation term that he was on. Uh, this looks a very, very uh, likely decision exactly because this, this term is so convenient uh, in not being over terrorizing it's not too long uh it, it won't uh as i would say terrify or energize his supporters into some uh activity but at the same time it very nicely covers the whole of election cycle uh, i do think that the main goal is to ensure his absence during both uh, the electoral campaign and its aftermath in 2021 and the uh, electoral campaign the presidential elections of 2024 or earlier as they may happen earlier which is not an impossible uh scenario uh so February the 2nd. On uh, February, I think, 11th and 12th in Belarus uh, will uh, happen its uh, of, of a constitutional assembly of unclear nature. And Belarus has been mentioned. And I think we do witness a kind of unification of these two protest pools. Russians have been watching Belarus last summer and autumn with focused attention. And now the Belarus, the Belarusian protesters are watching uh, Russia. So there's this perverse kind of union, while at the same time, there is the thing that has been mentioned here, authoritarian learning. Although I think the main thing Russia can learn from the example of Belarus is that it can uphold its current power only with the help of the big neighbor, and Russia doesn't have the same type of big neighbor if we do not imagine the president of Russia coming to China for help, which no one of us would like to live to see. Uh, so this, this is also a political event which will be important for Russia too. In the end of February, we are going to have a Nemtsov's march, which is a traditional demonstration which is going to be sanctioned, or there will be a scandal because it has been going on for, for five years. It's a traditional, I would say, political institution already. Uh, by that time, the election campaign is going to start in earnest. And there's one more subplot to this election plot, which I would like to point your attention to. And this is the power struggle within the Communist Party. 
The Communist Party is experiencing the same transfer process, the same transfer troubles as Russia in general. They also have an aging leader and a very uh, attractive heritage to share between the ears. And there's one wing which is very close to uh, Navalny's people. And there's another wing. Uh, there's pressure from below where many regional and local activists who want to get elected and don't care about the agreements uh, of the top party management with the presidential administration push the party towards more radical side or rather just towards more dialogue with the voters because they, these people want to get elected somewhere. And there's the top management who wants to end their lives quietly. So this is one of the things that will influence the conduct of, of the parliamentary campaign. Then we'll have the registration period, the campaign as such, elections, uh, accusations of falsifications, fight for the votes, and possibly protest afterwards. That's 2021 20, for you. Thank you very much. Uh, Clara and Mark, we have a couple of minutes left, so some brief final words from you. Go ahead, Mark. Go ahead. No, no, you. <laughs> I'll be super quick. Um, I would just say a couple of things. One is that um, the Navalny movement has all the tools. So this is from a protest perspective. He has all the tools to keep the protest going and indeed to grow the protest, to, to make it larger and spread it more widely across Russia to see the protests in the regional cities becoming more marked. Um, and I would also say he doesn't have to have it continue forever. He needs it to continue until the election campaign begins in earnest for, for the Duma elections, possibly until the Duma elections itself. But even if it continues for only a few months, it can already be very damaging, very dramatic. The other thing we need to watch for is obviously the reaction of the state, how the state will react at the moment. Certainly the first March showed that they were trying to strike some sort of balance, not quite the violence of the past, not quite the easygoing nature. And as we've said, they're very inflexible, so it will be very difficult for them to modulate their response. So I think I would I would watch that carefully, but it's um, certainly it, everything points to this continuing for, for some time. I mean, my view is that I'm not convinced that the momentum of the actual street protests will continue indefinitely. Um, Sunday, who knows, uh, quite an open challenge deciding to hold your march right in front of the, of the Lubyanka, but I suspect it'll, it, it'll go ahead fine. The issue is that exactly because it might be hard to maintain the same momentum and we're all going to get obsessed with the metrics, how many towns do they have protesters in, how many protesters in aggregate, how many arrests, that means that they become sort of susceptible to that. So I suspect Team Navalny need to be thinking about modifying what counts as, as success, what counts as victory. Otherwise the state will seize the first time that there's any, any kind of dip. And therefore I think they, they need to be, and this is where they, can, they, they, they too can learn from, from Belarus, look at other ways in which you keep up the protest, whether it's getting it to be more, more quirky and we're talking about flash mobs and everyone wearing the same kind of socks on a Wednesday or whatever, there are all kinds of other things that can be done. And at the same time, to pick up on a point from Yekaterina, exactly, it's also about reaching out to the systemic opposition and in many ways offering them this challenge, are you more systemic or more opposition? I think the Liberal Democrats on the whole, but not always, we know where they are. The communists, there's much more mileage, both in, in Moscow and, and outside. And I think this is where the real battleground is gonna be. It's not gonna be in Moscow. It's not gonna be the big names. It's gonna be the regional organizers and the regional politicians. And to put it another way, if I were channeling my inner Silovic, that's where I'd be putting the pressure. I, I would say, let's not necessarily go after, except in the usual way, the sort of Yuvov Sabol and, and Kiryamish and so forth. Instead, who are the community organizers in Vladivostok, in Novosibirsk, and let's make damn sure we, we give them a, a real or metaphorical kicking to basically try and ensure that it's a movement that has a leadership, but no followers. Thank you very much for that, Mark. Apologies to everybody who asked a question, uh, uh, but I wasn't able to uh, get round to it. Some really brilliant questions. So if only we had double the amount of time. Uh, let me thank our three excellent panelists, uh, Clara, Mark and Yukaterina, for what was a really uh, fascinating event. And I hope members of the audience enjoyed it too. So please, if you're sitting alone, uh, applaud our panelists as if we were all together. Thank you, everybody, for joining and have a good afternoon.